last season on Lawful Stupid. Darling, mm-hmm. you come to find out that the cradle of time is missing. She goes to the time temple, leaning against the pedestal. Is that time lord breathing heavily, wounded? I have a proposition for you. <coughs> All right. I'll hear you out. I want you to take my powers and eventually take my place. Find Cassiel. Restore him. Or we're all doomed. I guess I'll do that. You make the conclusion that Cassiel's not on Goron. You hunt down another door. It wasn't destroyed. Do you open it and go through? Yes. Carter Spawn looks at you. He points to a door and he says, Go get Cassiel. Save him. She'll nod her head. You you turn and you open the door back to Goron. Carter Spawn vanishes. And that's where it all fades to black. The scene opens up. In the heart of the vast city of ships known as the Menagerie. In one hand he holds his staff. In the other he holds the Cradle of Time. The Grand Magus becomes a beacon of light. Channeling the Cradle's clockwork energies. A flash of green, a flash of blue, fill the air. The Grand Magus watches as time begins. It's slow and arduous. Retreat. Gus, you remember that you are in the Wizard's Tower. It's Grand Magus's Tower. And you were sleeping on what to do with the Cradle of Time. When you exit your digs in the Grand Magus's Tower... And go into the library. A hammock in the kitchen, I'm sure. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, And you go into the library, and you find Darling. And Darling explains to you that the Grand Magus and Declan are nowhere to be found. And Paul Barrow is in a coma in his room and is several decades older. Whoa. Uh, so, uh, okay, well, probably the only thing that could fix him is gone now. Uh, cause our dad and the Red Magus ran off with the Cradle of Time. Okay, what's the plan, Sprout? I don't think there's a plan that she has. And I, I think I think Gus and her have a conversation um, about what to do next. And she, she is intent on going back to the Temple of Time. And I don't think Gus is. Absolutely not. So what does Gus do instead? I think... I mean... We've lost enough, right? And, like, we we did so in the name of, like, making sure that our dad was safe to, like, repay him for all that he's done for us. Like, but he just keeps doing these things. Like, he's never going to be safe. Uh... Gus has lost too much and he has too much left to lose, I think. So probably grab Paul Barrow, um, hop in in the car, uh, ride it back to Prentice, grab May, and we're on a boat, dude. We're going back. We'll we'll hopefully be able to 
take care of Paul and maybe uh, maybe nurse him back to some state of health. You know, see if we can find a healer for him or something. And uh, yeah, and I and and you do, and you're you go back to your hometown, I think, um, and begin working on your shop. Tell me, tell me what what the rest of Gus's life looks like. Yeah, so Gus has, uh, you know, a relatively peaceful life. He's still, um, I think people in, in the area look to him now, like if danger does arise, because he is like a pretty powerful, like, force at this point. So he does, I think, keep, like, his immediate surroundings pretty safe. Um, but... I mean, he's him and May are. Uh, we we brought back some flutter pups. We're raising flutter pups. Ooh, uh, nice. We uh, we're working on the uh, on on the on the restaurant. The two spoons is enough. We're we started delivering because I've got uh, the panda uh, sugar and spice are retired now. They've been they've been long retired because. Uh, uh, <laughs> a whole sled team of uh, flutter pups. monster bit enhanced flutter pups yes. uh, have a flying Panda Express, so we were able to expand our, our network and start delivering. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we we take care of Paul Bear as best as we can. Um, hopefully, I mean, I don't know what the future holds for him uh, if 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 he ever comes back to us. But uh, Gus won. <laughs> Gus uh, won D and D, guys. <sighs> After the struggle and the fight and the emotional turmoil that Gus has endured over these past few months, for a year, really, um, he finds peace. He find he paid his debt, realizing that his father has his own issues, and that Gus doesn't have to give up his own life for that. And I think that they say that the sweetness to that. They say that if you're traveling around Riverside and you're famished, you might be able to look up to the sky and hear a friendly voice call. Hey, have you eaten today? And our view shifts. Our focus shifts. <sighs> we look back in time once more. And we see a young a youngling, a young orphan, as it were. I'm an elf. Thank you. A young elf. Um, and why don't you describe the the image of, of, of your character's beginning? Like, what he looks so- like and stuff like that. What you see is um, a dirty little street urchin he's got um you know brownish shaggy hair kind of like swept to one side kind of matted with all kinds of gross uh he's wrapped up in basically just one big rag that he's wrapped around himself like a like a toga um he's got a uh very rudimentary like crutch uh like basically just a, a stick uh, that he leans on, you see that he's he's missing his uh, right leg from the knee below, uh, and uh, he is an orphan, and he's just begging uh, on the streets. Of uh, Oxbane, right? Of Oxbane. Uh, one thing is that he is ke- kind of keeping an eye out on the crowd. He's heard some rumors. Uh, about a certain uh, certain figure he wants to meet, so he's keeping an eye on the crowd, looking for a uh, a distinct uh, hat. Um, and he and he does, and and the funny thing is, uh, or not maybe not funny, but 
Declan is a purveyor of things, an explorer of things, but if anything, he's a collector of souls, truly. And um, Declan happens upon our, our young hero in the making um, and says, uh, Well, look at you. All in mostly one piece, but standing proud. What's your name, little one? Oh, I'm Drake, sir. Well, Drake, what is it that you do? Well, I, I don't do too much. I'm just a little fellow, but I, I can do anything you need. I, I, I could, uh, I could be a help on the road if you was, if you was uh, doing, if you was uh, <laughs> traveling. I could, I could uh, make camp or get fetch water. Or... Well, I wouldn't want to take you away from your parents, little one. I have, I don't have no them, sir. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. There's, there's a lot of us. Mm. Yes, the uh, the closing of the doors will do that. Um, I can give you gold. And he, he reaches out and into his pack and pulls out a, a sack of gold, and it's a lot, and goes to hand it to Drake. No, 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 sir. Uh, you see, I, I actually know who you are. Uh, you're, oh. you're Declan Derringer, right? Uh, guilty, yes. Yeah, I, I heard about you. You're, you're the explorer guy. You, you go around and you see all kinds of stuff and you find treasures and things that nobody's seen. I, I do. I, I do look for the unknown. I, I don't want any of your coin and I don't... I don't need help. I'll, I'll help you. I'll do whatever you ask me to, but I, I want you to take me to where the dragons are. He ponders for a moment and says, that's, that's a very dangerous place. I don't care. I know danger, mister. It, it, it doesn't scare me. I just, I gotta see him. All right, Drake. If you want to see where the dragons are, I'll take you. But it's not a short trip, and you're going to have to grow a lot to get there. He kind of stands up tall. I'll do it. Whatever you say. First, we're going to have to we have to make some changes for you. And, and Declan looks down at the, the missing leg. I think we can... I have a a son, Kato. I think he might be able to help you out. (laughs) Oh, boy. And, uh, Drake joins Declan. And I know, I know where you want the next piece to go but why don't you do a montage or describe what you're looking for between Drake the Orphan and you know Drake the Man yeah I think uh, we see uh, a young restless boy Uh, he's going through the Derringer estate he's uh listening to every word that his older siblings say he kind of is uh a little bit of a hanger on he always wants to be involved with what's going on uh always wants to know what the bigger kids are doing he's also reading constantly anything that's in the library about dragons first mostly stuff with pictures at first (laughs) uh and then he kind of branches out as he gets more and more serious about his study um a big lover of animals uh, so I think he spends a lot of time pestering Gus uh, to turn into different shapes uh, so that he can get a look at animals that he hasn't seen before hmm and talk to me about Drake's obsession it's dragons man ever since he was he was there in Oxbane he was there the night that Fendel 
took to the skies as this silvery terror and just destroyed all of these fiends that had taken his parents, his leg, his life, his hope, his future. And then he just saw them laid low by this amazing bestial force of nature. And ever since then, he hasn't been able, every time he closes his eyes, it's just dragons flying around. I think there's a moment for Drake as, as he approaches adulthood and, or his teenage years where uh, Declan is embarking on another adventure and Drake is there at his heels again begging to be taken where the dragons are. Come on, Declan. We've been through this so many times. How long am I going to have to wait? <clears throat> Drake, you're not even a man yet. It, it, if if I take you where the dragons are now, you'll either be eaten or you're just going to jump on one and fly away. That is the best case scenario, yes. Yeah, but I just don't think you're ready yet. And I did promise you I would take you there eventually. But give it time. You have a long life ahead of you. All right. He, like, ruffles your your hair a little bit and says, I'll be back. And when I come back, we can talk about this further. Keep up with your studies and your training. Yeah, I will. And uh, Declan departs for his next great adventure. What does Drake do? Drake uh, is tired of waiting. Drake uh, is, is getting into his teenage years. He's starting to doubt the uh, un, uneffable uh, authority of his parents, uh, of his father, Declan. Uh, and he did recently see his older sister, Darling, uh, give him a big fat middle finger and dip out on her own. Uh, so I think what he's going to do is he's going to bail. He's going to dip. He's going to seek out the one person uh, that has carried on Findle's legacy, and that's Christoph Shindo, baby. Hmm. Where does he start? That's a good question. I think he starts in Oxbane. Uh, I think he would be able to maybe track down. Is Carter Spawn still around? I don't. He's a guardian now. I don't know if he's still hanging out in Oxbane. Uh, He's trying to find people that are that that would know Kristoff. So I think you do start in Oxbane, but I think that very quickly gets you to Yuri. Yeah, much bigger city, um, and I think through your search, and it takes him a while to go from Oxbane to go through Yuri, but I think eventually he stumbles across. An old friend, not not for Drake, but an old friend of ours, Wendy Starspray. Mm. And I think um, you know she's older now and, and a little more calm. And she says, I- "I'm sorry, you're looking for Kristoff Shendo, as in the Guardian." <laughs> yes, ma'am. The the the. The Silver Serpent himself, that's who I'm looking for. Why? Because I'm, I need to thank him. One, well, I want to thank Findle, but he's not around anymore. And so that's the next best I can do. But also because I, I have some questions for him about dragons. He's not really... He's not really the social type these days, but let me see what I can do about getting a message out. I happen to know someone he's very close with. And I, and I think, Thank you, miss. Thank you so much. I think Drake has to wait for almost a month and a half, two months, in Yuri. And, and each time going to Wendy, hey, did you... What do we know? And each time is, have patience. The message is sent. 
he will come. And I think you're doing odd jobs around and one of the ends in Yuri to pay for your food and, and, and your board and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it's it's probably a combination of odd jobs, going back to begging, and then like sneaking out of Yuri to hunt game when he gets desperate. I think um, one day you're like mucking the stalls of, of, of the inn and you're just fucking filthy, right? And you... You are fucking hot and it stinks. And out of nowhere, the temperature drops by like 30, 40 degrees. It's no longer 100. You, you start to get cold. Um, the air chills and you hear, I heard you've been looking for me. You're him. You're Christoph Shindo. I know you are. He turns around and sure enough, Christoph like uh, pats his hand down as if to gesture to keep it down. Yes, yes, that's that is me. But we don't need to broadcast it there, do we? No, you're right, Mr. Shindo. I'm sorry. You... I'm not an easy... tiefling to get, get a hold of. But you bent the right ears. What can I do for you, little one? First off, Mr. Shindo, I... I want to express my gratitude, um... You see, I was in Oxbane the, the day that the Findle, he he came through as, as a, this great dragon and he just killed all these fiends. And, mm. uh, and I, those are the fiends what took a lot from me. Uh, it took a lot from everyone. I never got to thank him, Findle, uh, but I, I know that... You kind of inherited his legacy a little bit, so I, I want to tell you thank you, sir. Thank, thank you for for him. I understand your gesture, but I can't thank Fendel enough. But I, I took his his spot, and I protect our realm. So I suppose. In Findle's stead, I will say you're welcome. It means a lot, sir. Um, the other thing is, ever since that day, I haven't been able to get dragons out of my head, not for one second, not for even one moment. And I gotta know more. I gotta see him. I gotta, I gotta touch him, Mr. Shindo. I gotta, I gotta know what that's like. And you might be the only one who can help me. Kristoff kneels kneels down a little bit. Um, oh, I guess Kristoff's not very tall. Never mind. Um, He's six one. Was he? I guess the He's other two motherfuckers were so Titanic too. Rowan was Rowan was little. Rowan was little. He was uh, like five six. Damn. I guess I got them fucked up. Um, so Kristoff, uh, it's been four years. Kristoff um, kind of kneels down a little bit and says. Um, It's nice to see someone with a passion for dragons. I spent so long hating them for what they did to me, for the heritage, for the the upbringing that I had to endure. It's, it's touching to see someone see them for the majestic creatures and guardians they are. And uh, Kristoff like snaps off his mask um, and reveals his face and it, it, it should be said that Kristoff who was a very handsome man and then still is there are scars below his eyes and um, while Drake doesn't understand that it, it is from prolonged use of the artifacts in his travels. (sighs) 
I... I can't do more for you than what I'm about to do. I can't do it in good conscience, and I can't expose you to that risk, and truly, I have more to do, but what I can do, and he, he holds his mask in his hand, the same mask that had, had protected him from the fiends, from crooked people in Oxbane, the same mask that was a symbol of hope in Yuri. And he hands it to Drake and says, Maybe you can carry on where I left off someday. He takes it in like small, trembling hands, uh, kind of looking at it with reverence. Oh, th- thank you, Mr. Shield. I'll, I'll, I'm going to meet the dragons one day. And when I do, I'll, I'll be wearing this mask and I'll tell them all about you. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, a, it's about time I stopped wearing that thing. Everyone knows who I am anyways. <laughs> and he, he puts a hand on Drake's shoulder and Drake immediately feels a chill. will kind of go through him and he says... I do want you to remember, young one, if you ever find yourself in dire straits, in trouble, and in danger, just whisper my name, and I'll be there. Thank you, Mr. Shindo. Thank you so much. (laughs) And I think, um, I think Drake, like, turns around to to like not like ball in front of his hero right to wipe his tears away yeah and when he turns turns around Kristoff's gone Every RPG player knows that the scariest final boss isn't Tiamat, Vecna, or Orcus. Why? It's none other than scheduling a game! That foul beast! It's no one's fault they can't make it, Tim. So how do we get a game together that is exciting, fresh, and worth exploring? The answer is plainly... Roleplay Revolution! Roleplay Revolution allows you to generate ready-to-run adventures in minutes comes complete with NPCs, monsters, maps, and more. What a hoot! Your adventures can be highly complex for even the most intelligent, or as simple as you require. Isn't that right, Timmy? Roleplay Revolution has powerful tools that let you tweak your adventure after initial creation, so don't worry about all those last-minute great ideas that you come up with. You start by just throwing out some of your favorite themes, movies, games, etc. Just to get the juices flowing a bit. Want to mix high fantasy with your favorite RPG title? Go crazy. A mustachioed plumbing brothers and steampunk? You got it. Your imagination is the limitation. Roleplay Revolution allows you to create the game you'd love to run, but just don't have the time to write. To spice it up even more... Let's assume that Tim and your other quote-unquote friends are indisposed for a long period of time. Never fear! Roleplay Revolution has an AI-powered DM named Oracle, that's nice, that will never leave and keep its time commitments. Oracle will run the adventures you generate for you. You can run the adventures solo with Oracle or have a GM for you and your friends. It's free to try. But we, Lawful Stupid, hope you'll hear this and go for the annual subscription. If you purchase the annual subscription and use the code LAWFULSTUPID at checkout, you'll get a whopping 20% off the total price. Head on over to RoleplayRev.com and let the games begin. What does Drake do next? 
he's got what he came for um, in a way. He he met Kristoff. He has you know reavowed his goal in his heart, and he can kind of feel that uh, as he holds this mask. And he, I think he's just like clutching it as tight as he can as he makes his way back home to the Danger Estate. Hmm. And tell me what happens that first night. Yeah, he, he just kind of sneaks in. Um, <laughs> Kato's standing in a inactive state in the hallway so he's got to like sneak past him it's like and it, the facial recognition wouldn't clear because he's got the mask <laughs> uh, and he just makes it back to his bedroom um, and he just he, he curls up that night clutching this this silver mask and he dreams like he always does of dragons but when he wakes up, something's a little different. Is it? Something's a little, something's a little special. He when, he when he fell asleep clutching this silvery mask, instead, he feels something moving. And there is a small, copper-colored, stout, toadish dragonling in his arms. What does Drake name this dragon? The most na- noble and fitting name that could ever be given to <laughs> his dragon companion, which is... Glorp! <laughs> Drake with his new found friend. Time marches on. It marches forward. And I think, I think Drake is young, but I think Declan still calls upon him anyways when it comes to Agos. Um, he needs somebody who can uh, <laughs> not who can. He needs somebody who wants to learn about the dragons that the Geosquam worship. And I think it takes time, but but Drake makes his way to Agos. Tell me tell me what that journey looks like for, for Drake, like what he's going through as he's making his way to Agos and then to the Geosquam itself. Yeah, so this is um, so this is a, f- a few years in the future. This is like a 19-year-old uh, Drake um, and Quarp. Uh, uh, it is uh, them. They, they've gone on some adventures. They've kind of done their thing. Quarp is no longer a small puppy-like dragonling. He is now um, a medium-sized. Uh, quadrupedal uh very still very stout very uh very very i don't i don't know how to describe the way that he walks are are, are the wings smaller than they should be the wings are not smaller than they should be the wings are like are are like pretty long but they're they're they're, they fold kind of into his rounded body um he's got like a like a a saddle made up on the back um with uh a, a a a custom notch on it where you see a, a, a large um, kind of advanced looking rifle uh, sitting and uh, it's, it's kind of cradled there and, and you see uh, Drake kind of leading warp uh, by his bridle as they're making their way off their ship and into Agos and uh, and he does he he finds his way to the guest bomb and he makes connections and and the fact that he has a dragon with him the guest bomb show him reverence um and i think he learns the language um i i think honestly drake kind of loses touch with declan and the others 
and just mm-hmm. falls into this obsession with these dragons and, and learning what he can about their culture. Um, I did I did save one of my language proficiencies. I took it as GIF, but in my head I was like, that's G for Geosquam, baby. I want to know that language. <laughs> And so I think um, I think you you do you are able to communicate it without issue, and you learn the language, and you learn their their whole belief system, and and it is through this effort that Drake learns that the Giosbom they worship six dragons, and these six dragons make up the elements of the world, and. And they always refer to them as otherworldly. Um, and you you understand the reverence of that. Or Drake understands the reverence of that. And, and why it's important that they don't... Um, that they don't use the portal to go into the other worlds. That they they do what the dragons have requested, which is protect it stop people from traversing it um and I think Drake spends several years with them um which kind of leads us into uh another couple years of, of time passing I don't think he really is in touch with civilization proper at all during that time as much as he is just going from the ruins of World End, World's End to the different tribes of the Giosbom. The the real question I have for for Drake is there has been this civil war among the Giosbom. Um and decidedly uh Tuk Tuk lost. Um and there's this other more feral group of Giosbom. But there's so many more that are docile and, and just they just want to stay out of it. What is Drake's outlook on that? Yeah, he spends a lot of his time trying to help um the kind of downtrodden Geosquam people who who are are stuck in this conflict. So he's spending a lot of time moving them from like safe place to safe place, and um, you know, getting into skirmishes with kind of the the I don't know what you call the the bad Geosquam. <laughs> the fer- the, I just call them feral. The fer- yeah, the ferals. Um, and uh, I think that they they start to look mostly towards Gorp uh, and and less towards Drake, but they start to look towards them as a unit is kind of like a a guardian um this dragon that's protecting the them the guardian of the gears bomb and i think you do that i think you protect them the gears bomb from not only the ferals but also the dangers that exist on a ghost because these are these are gears bomb that were displaced because for the most part while they were tribal, they they all existed in World's End, and and when the Pharaohs raised that city to the ground, so many of them were displaced. And time passes as time as time does, and I think there's a there's a time where Drake and Quorp are eating, maybe over a campfire, just. You know, taking care of things, and um, a familiar figure approaches your campfire, and she says, "Um, "Would it be okay if I just had a seat next to you?" And you would know uh, by the voice that it's your older sister, Darling. (laughs) Well, of course, Darling. Come on and have a seat. Hmm. You you've grown quite a bit. Uh. And you too, Drake. And she ruffles, uh, not ruffles, but scratches um, on the head of Gorp. Yeah, he's he's been earning his keep for us out here, all right. Mm, I've I've heard, I've seen. I'm impressed, really. 
What brings you here, sister? I, I, I haven't talked to another Derringer, you know. Uh, uh, oh, God, it's been a long time. Oh, no. I was supposed to check in. Uh, all right. Well, uh. <laughs> it, it, it's fine. I couldn't tell you either. Time is a tricky thing. <sighs> but, uh. I got something for you. All right, what is it? Do you remember when you were a child and you were obsessed with dragons? Only slightly. Just a little bit? I can maybe barely recall that. Yeah, yeah. And you... I've kept tabs on you. Kisses Gorp on the face. Yeah. (laughs) Hmm. Give daddy kisses. Hmm. Uh... And you seem rather obsessed with the, um, we'll say religion of the Chaos Bomb. Mm, and hey, the dragon. I've learned a lot, actually. How would you like to meet him? Oh, Barry, the lead one, oh, just sister, what are we waiting for? He's gonna hop on Gwarp's saddle and be like, let's go! Okay. Gorp, we're going to have to do something weird. We're going to have to go through a portal. But but there's going to be more dragons where we're going. Yeah. I missed you, Gorp. Drake? There's no one better for this. Come on. Let's go! And, uh... Darling leads Drake and Gorp to the doors. And together, you cross the threshold into the corridors. And our story comes to an end. Our meeting of Drake fades fades to black. (sighs) Our vision is filled with the image of a grand temple. In the heart of that temple amidst statues of dragons and doors that seem to connect worlds beyond imagination. The Grand Magus stands before seven avatars of the majestic dragons, each representing a different color and elemental force. Their iridescent scales shimmer with power, and their eyes glisten with ancient wisdom the dragons regard the wizard with a mixture of awe and skepticism they sense the heaviness of grief and responsibility upon him great guardians of the elemental forces of the worlds the grand magus began his voice almost false fake full of sorrow. I bring forth a grave warning that transcends the boundaries of all worlds. A threat to all the worlds is coming. It's already started. One that seeks to engulf not only this world, but all the worlds connected by the doors. All the worlds that exist. The dragons exchange glances, their expressions revealing skepticism, humor, about the the human before them. And what proof do you offer, human? The sapphire-colored dragon asked, her voice resonating like a gentle waterfall. I offer you the proof of time, the Grand Magus raises the dormant cradle of time. 
I assure you, the futures I have seen and lived speak of an impending gluttonous evil, one that cannot be ignored. The ruby dragon snorts, flames dance along his snout and his, his bright, flaming mustache barrels and, and roars to life. Humans are prone to overreacting and creating tales of doom to suit their whims. We have protected these worlds for eons. We are not swayed by mortal fears. I do not seek to incite fear, but to seek your wisdom, the Grand Magus replied earnestly. I beseech you to heed my words and join forces. Together we can uncover the truth and thwart this menace. The topaz dragon rumbles deeply, the ground vibrating beneath them. The earth almost shakes as he moves. Our duty is to safeguard the balance. And while we respect your gifts of magic, we cannot be swayed by emotions and anecdotes evidence alone. The Grand Magus sighs. Frustration with the dragon's reluctance. I do not expect blind trust. Allow me to share the futures I've witnessed. The harbingers of this impending darkness. Only then can you judge the gravity of the situation. As he speaks, the Grand Max's eyes glow with an ethereal light, projecting scenes of chaos, impending disasters, and creatures shrouded in malevolence onto the very fabric of reality. The dragons watch in silence, their skepticism slowly changing to rage, to contemplation as they watch some of their own perish as they watch their world take to the sea. These are but glimpses of what awaits if we do not act, the Grand Magus implores them. I may be a man weighed down by mortality, but it is that very truth that fuels my determination to protect all that I hold dear. The dragons exchange glances once more. The weight of the moment, palpable. The tension. We shall deliberate on your words. The aquamarine dragon speaks, their voice carrying like a gentle breeze. The Grand Magus nodded, gratitude flickering in his eyes. Time is of the essence. Together we can face this threat head on, for it knows no boundaries and sinks to extinguish all that we hold sacred. As the dragons retreat to consider the gravity of the Grand Magus' words, he stands alone, hoping that his plea would bridge the divide between the wisdom of ancient beings and the heart of a mortal man. In this moment of uncertainty, the fate of all worlds sway in the wind.